I was talking with a friend the other day. He's an engineer. Um, he's worked for a few tech companies and he's told me that he's seen a lot of the people that are making decisions about those companies' futures have little or no engineering experience. So they make decisions without fully understanding the impact that those decisions may have on whatever product or widget they were producing. Uh, so, for example, if the decision was made to go with a cheaper alternative material, would it still work? Would that widget still work? Uh, and of course, unfortunately, engineers, he says, were called in, usually after the fact, to clean up whatever mess was made as a result of that decision. How many times have we read that our government or perhaps our ministries have made decisions that perhaps weren't quite clearly thought through all the way? Flint, Michigan recently changed its water supply from getting its water that's been processed and treated from a, from a neighboring city to getting its water from the Flint River, and you'd think that makes sense. However, that water was not treated properly. And so what happened was that the pipes, the old pipes that were made of lead, the lead leached into the water supply and made a lot of people sick because somebody did not think through the possible scientific or technological ramifications of a de decision that they were making. And now a lot of people have a lot of problems that they have to deal with. Decisions that managers make not only affect their employees, they also affect, they also affect their employees' families. And they also affect the contractors that work for their companies and the contractors' families and the subcontractors who could be scattered across the globe. So the reach of our decisions is often very much further than we initially think it might be. We're all members of a global society. We share the same needs, water, food, shelter. We have the same hopes and dreams to fall in love, to raise a family, to make a decent wage. And because of technology, more so than ever before, everyone on this planet is even more interconnected than ever before. Now sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes this connectivity can be a benefit. If you have a question about something, chances are somebody somewhere also has that same question. And if you're lucky, you might even find that answer. But sometimes this interconnectivity can lead to serious consequences. Creating incredibly complex, difficult problems. And it's going to be up to our children, more often than not, to solve those problems. What kinds of problems are we talking about? Well, the first few are, you know, you can probably figure what those are. It's climate change, pandemic disease, financial meltdowns. These are all interconnected problems that no single people or country can solve on its own. Nations must work together across borders, across oceans, across cultures to solve these problems and other ones that will arise. As we work together, well, we're all engineers of some kind. We're fixing problems, we're solving problems. And to be successful, we all need to work together. We need to work across those borders, across those oceans, and across those cultures. It's so critical that all cultures of the world work together and be respected for what each can bring to the table. Each can contribute to solve that problem. When we work together, it's like a beautiful picture, a wonder to behold. And as you drill down into that picture, you'll find even more beautiful things, smaller beautiful things that when they work together, end up in that wonderful product. As we work together with our colleagues across the globe to solve problems or to prevent problems from occurring, we must understand that local customs and traditions, custom, context is important wherever our project will reside. Grand Cayman is at a crossroads right now. Important decisions on technical, social, economic issues are being made daily. The dump, the new airport, the proposed new dock, the highway, the road extensions into the eastern districts, and the new high schools, all very important decisions. 
need to be made. And it's so vital that those decisions that are made are made by people who are technically competent and trained to be able to make those decisions. Technology is everywhere in society. It's part of the fabric of our lives. It is part of what we do and how we connect with each other. And because technology is so important, it is essential that we must understand how we interact with each other through that technology. And to become a contributing member to today's society, everyone needs to be technically literate at some level. Why is that? Dr. Maria Klawe, former Dean of Engineering at Princeton University and now President of Harvey Mudd College, says that there are four reasons that everyone needs to have some sort of engineering training. Well, first, because technology and engineering affects everybody's lives. It's just that simple. At birth, there's a hospital that, in case you need extra care. When you go to school, technology affects how we learn, what we learn, and where we learn it. When we get a job, technology enables us to work with people around the globe. And at death, if you Google ashes in space, go ahead and Google that phrase, not now, later, ashes in space, you'll find, you'll come up with 29 million hits. And the first page has at least five companies that offer to send your loved ones to space for as little as $2,000. Now that's not while they're alive, okay, that's after they've moved on, okay? That's, don't get too excited about that. You know. Second, because technology develops at such a rapid, rapid rate. I have one word for you, computers. Just compare the power of the computer that's in your pocket. Now you call it a cell phone. This is a computer. Compare the power of this computer to the one your parents used when they went to school. Third, because societal impact of engineering solutions and engineering developments is tremendous. Migration is now cheaper and more effective than ever before. And this applies, of course, to people, but it also applies to viruses and diseases. Not only the ones that infect people, but also the ones that infect our technology. And finally, because decision makers need technological training so that they can make well-informed decisions about the future of our lives. Does that sound familiar? How do we do this? How do we instill some basic training, some basic knowledge, technical skills into all of our students, into everyone, into the general population, out of which will eventually rise the next generation of our leaders? Well, through education, of course. Well, the problem is that according, for example, according to the U.S. National Education Association, our educational programs were designed and developed for a society that no longer exists. Back in the 1950s, we had to learn the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? Right. Well, in today's society, for a student to be successful, and a contributing member to today's society, to become a leader in today's society, they have to be able to navigate the four C's. Collaboration, creativity, communication, and critical thinking. So when it comes to technical education, not only do we need to rethink what we teach and how we teach it, but we have to make it accessible to everyone. We also need to teach it at a level that everyone can understand it, not to just the few that we've always taught it to. How do we do this? How do we make our technological education accessible to all students, not just those that we have normally taught it to? Well, I have two ideas. Number one, proper mentoring. And not just those who are already in our schools, but to those whom we wish to attract to our schools. And this mentoring needs to begin early in a child's life. 
According to Bill Nye, Bill Nye the science guy, STEM education needs to be a priority long before a child reaches high school. A study reported in the US News and World Report says that by the time a child reaches middle school, half of those children no longer think that science will be relevant to their futures or do not understand the implications of technology in the world. Number two, our curricula needs to be modified to include topics such as business savvy, leadership skills, cultural diversity, and societal impact. Let's see how these skills might fit under those four C's that I mentioned before. Well, in today's economy, business smarts is important in thinking about and in making good decisions. To be an effective leader, people have to understand where you're taking them. You have to be able to communicate well. And as you collaborate with colleagues around the world, being aware of local traditions and local customs, very important. And of course, part of being a creative problem solver is being able to understand the context, where that solution will live. I'd like to add a few more topics to this list. Social media gets the word out really quickly. A rally, a protest, or something about the latest missteps of a political figure. Uh, this power can certainly be harnessed to bring about creative and useful solutions to today's problems. Interdisciplinary teamwork is a key to developing technological solutions. People from different countries see things from different points of view, and ultimately those points of view will contribute to a good solution to the problem. But of course, merely being aware of other people's differences is not enough. You have to actively participate with the people from other cultures to fully understand where they're coming from. What can we do? What can we do in our colleges, in our schools, in our universities to create some sort of technical or technological literacy in our students? Well, I like to suggest three things. First, we should implement team-based learning, team-based projects throughout the curriculum, and not just, just before graduation when we typically think our students are ready to graduate. In the first year, for example, all students, regardless of major, can be engaged in a the sky's the limit project to design a creative solution to a problem or something that they see needs to be fixed. I do this in my class as sophomore level class and sometimes we look at things like um, how can I make downtown more attractive? How can I clean up this part of the part of the town? And I tell the students, cost is no object. Be creative. Think. How can you do this? What can you do to fix this solution that you're not happy with? And then of course as students move through the program, you bring about more realistic constraints, cost, materials, and culture. A team should be kept small, and this is vital to the success of this approach. Because when you only have three or four members of a team, there's going to be so much to do, students will naturally, hopefully, start to, start to come out of their shells. And you will see hidden talents emerge that students didn't think they knew about or didn't think they had. Number two. We can ensure that the educational environment is conducive to learning by all students and is welcoming to all students. And this includes how we grade or assess students as educators, as teachers. We grade our students. We tell them how well they're doing. As a university educator for 30 years, I've spoken with many high school and middle school students who have shared with me why they perhaps may not be interested in studying engineering, and many of them say it's fear of failure. And failure is associated with good grades. Failure is associated with bad grades. Success with good grades. That is the traditional way of doing things. Well, maybe we need to re-examine this. How we reward success, how we measure success. Perhaps it can be modified so that students who may think it is a certain way, are afraid of that way when they see how it really is, are no longer afraid to try to do something new. 
One approach to this might be to assess a student's mastery of a topic. Mastery of a certain basic level of information can be assessed of all students. Now there will be those that master it and learn it really well and move on and those will become engineers or whatever and those will be some that won't. And that's okay because eventually they may and then they will move on to become engineers or they'll change majors, become artists, English majors, philosophy majors, history majors, and that's great. They have found their place and the university has helped them find their place. This is called mastery learning. It's a very uh, popular educational disruptor as we call them now, but it has its roots back in the time of Aristotle. Number three, remember those team-based projects? Well, we need to involve students, not just on our campuses where we are, but students all over the world need to participate. We've all heard of Doctors Without Borders, Engineers Without Borders. The American Society of Education calls this Classrooms Without Borders. The University of Southern California started this program back in 2009. And the director of that program has seen has, is convinced that how you learn, what you learn, depends on whom you learn it with. Program activities can begin with simple cross-cultural exercises, like thinking about or describing an object that works in your culture, but may not in another. And so for the teachers in the audience, this might be a good essay exercise. For the students in the audience, you might want to think about that during break or over dinner. What works well here in this culture, but may not in another culture? And I'll leave that for you to think about that one. At the end of the program, at the end of this program, students can then travel to the other countries, share with each other, build prototypes, share design ideas, so they can actually get a sense of context and how important context is to problem solving. The topic that we have here before us, of course, today is going to take more than 18 minutes to solve. However, every one of us can, in our own way, begin to take steps to address this matter. We can provide encouraging mentoring to budding engineers and scientists. We can update our curricula so that what we teach reflects what society may need in 2050, not what it used to need in 1950. And we can develop reward systems that are not punitive, but actually encourage and enhance student learning. At the end of the day, we will provide a much larger sector of our society with the opportunity to shape its future. Our leaders will now have the knowledge and be trained in technical matters so that they can make well-informed decisions. And society as a whole will be better. All members of society can work together to bring our civilization into its proper future. Thank you for listening.